Good, e good evening, everyone. I'm glad that you're with me this evening for our Wednesday night. And um, our Bible will be in Second Kings, the Old Testament here. Second Kings chapter 22. And we will be going through verses 14 through 20. <coughs> So I'll give you a minute to get turned to 2 Kings chapter 22, 14 through 20. And let's open up in prayer. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for gathering all of us together this evening, Lord, as we open up the word of God and study your word. Lord, we need your anointing to illuminate the truths that you have written in this chapter and help us to see what we need to see and hear what we need, Lord so that we can apply these truths to our life. We ask this in the name of Jesus, amen. <clears throat> so, record and this week's Bible study took place in the days of Josiah, king of Judah. He reigned between 640 and 609 BC. So he was a godly king known for his tireless attempts to purify Judah's worship and the temple. In the years preceding Josiah's rise to the throne, the kings of Judah had facilitated between devotion to the Lord and devotion to pagan idols. Josiah's great-grandfather, who was Hezekiah, had instituted a set of religious reforms that were intended to restore proper worship. But gross unfaithfulness to God, <clears throat> to the God of Israel, characterized in the reign of Hezekiah's son, who was Manasseh. Now, how many of you ever heard of King Manasseh? We all have. He was a wicked king. Manasseh encouraged worship of the Baals in Judah as well as the worship of the sun, moon, and the stars. So far as to even offer his son in child sacrifice and built pagan offer, altars within the Lord's temple itself. Only later in his reign that Manasseh repented of his sins, but his former evil ways contributed directly in Judah's ultimate destruction and exile. It was during Manasseh's reign <clears throat> that, that uh, Judah had gone too far. It had gone um, to the point where God has uh, set judgment down on Judah. But his um, it says, Joe, <clears throat> so um, Manasseh's evil ways, I wanted to bring out, also contributed directly in Judah's ultimate destruction and exile. See, God is going to send judgment on Judah. So Josiah's father, Ammon, <clears throat> of course, was no better than Manasseh. He uh, returned to the idolatry that characterized the NASA. King Ammon also was a wicked king. Now, King Ammon was Josiah's father. He was assassinated in a palace coup after a two-year reign, and the people of the land made his eight-year-old son, Josiah, king. <clears throat> and we see this written in 2 Kings 22, verse 1. It says that Josiah was eight years old when he became king years in Jerusalem. So he was young when he was placed on the throne. And it says in verse two, um, and he, Josiah, did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Now, I would like to 
is very remarkable for an eight-year-old boy to be so steadfast in what he believed to be true that he neither turned aside to the right hand or to the left, which means that Josiah always went, he, he was determined to go forward in God, not being wishy-washy, not being undecisive, not being easily manipulated. So for an eight year this shows how spiritually and emotionally mature that he was even at this this very young age. So godly advisors, um, you know, among Judah's aristocracy um, really influenced Josiah. <clears throat> Some are named in today's text. Other godly contemporaries included, <clears throat> excuse me, included well-known prophets. Zephaniah, a descendant King Hezekiah prophesied during the Jeremiah's prophetic ministry began in of Josiah five years before this event. No doubt their ministries made an impact on the result was that when Josiah was eight years old, I mean, 16 years old, he began to seek after the God of David, his father. It was in the 12th year of Josiah's reign that he began to purge the land of pagan idols and shrines. Six years later, <clears throat> King Josiah, a renovation of the temple. The temple was in a terrible state of disrepair because of all the pagan uh, shrines and the, the pagan worship that had taken place in the temple of God. In the process of this cleaning and repairing the temple, they found uh, a book of the law was found. Scholars disagree regarding the fact, identity um, of the book that was found. Some believe that it was the five books of Moses that was found, which is also known as the Torah or the Pentateuch. Some believe that it was just the book of Deuteronomy. Sometime in the decades during the reign of wicked King Manasseh and the wicked king of Ammon, the book of the law was lost and forgotten. Perhaps idolatrous priests intentionally uh, took the book of the law and misplaced it or hid it because by hiding the word of God, it would hide their guilt of their own apostasy. It's that when Shaphan reported to Josiah on the process of the repair project, Shaphan also alerted the king to the discovery of this book. Given Josiah's reaction of distress to what he had, Deuteronomy may very well have been his identity. It detailed the punishments that Israel would suffer if the people failed to keep the covenant. These curses would culminate in exile from land. And you can read uh, from the land. Realizing the guilt of Judah, you know, Josiah commissioned a delegation to inquire of the Lord concerning the wrath that the king feared would soon be visited on him and upon his kingdom. A description of the nature of that delegation is now today's Bible study. And this is where our text opens. So let's read verse 14. So Hilkiah, 
Hilkiah the priest. I make uh, mention here that Hilkiah uh, was not only a priest, but he was the high priest. And then you have Hanukkah, Achor, Shaphan, and Haziah went to Huldah, the prophetess, the wife of Shulam, the son of Tikva, the son of Harkas, keeper of the wardrobe. She dwelt in Jerusalem in the second quarter, and they spoke with her. So this message from is given by a woman, a prophetess to King Josiah, not only to King Josiah, but also to the nation of Judah. She begins this message, thus says the Lord God of Israel, which really does mark her as a true prophet. Verse 15, then she said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, tell the man who sent you to me. So Huldah's are referring to King Josiah as the man that you sent to me. And so this kind of created space between the king and herself. Though she, so he was powerful, she was the one who had heard a true word from God to share. Her words reminded the delegation that Josiah was merely a man who, like all people, was subject to God's reign. She reinforces this message by a second, thus says the Lord, to emphasize that her words came from the Lord, not from her own convictions. <coughs> so look at verse Behold, I will bring calamity on this place and on its inhabitants. All the words of the book which the king of Judah has read incense to other gods that they might provoke me to all the works of their hands. <clears throat> Therefore my wrath shall be aroused against this place and shall not be quenched. But as for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord in, in this manner, you shall speak to him. Thus says the Lord of Israel concerning the words which you have heard. Because your heart was before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants and a curse, and you tore your clothes and wept before me, I also have Surely, therefore, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see all the calamity which I will bring on this place. So they brought back word to the king. <clears throat> as great as King Josiah's desire was to spare the nation of not save Judah from the coming judgment. It was inevitable. Regardless of the fact that Josiah was a godly king, and in the next chapter, he does bring reform into the land. He brings reform because he believes in the word of God. Even with this being done, God is still going to bring judgment upon Judah. Going on in this nation for hundreds even with the reforms that he is making, that the children of Israel are not going to stay close to God. They will eventually go back into idolatry. He knows more wicked kings will come to power and bring back the Baal worship and bring back the wickedness into the land. So look at Read Judges, especially, where the people would rebel against God, 
worship idols, live wickedly. God would send judgment. An enemy tribe would invade Israel and put the people in bondage. And they would suffer greatly. Then they would cry out to God and repent. God would raise up a prophet to bring reform, to bring deliverance. But once that prophet died, the people went back to their old wicked way. God would send judgment, which means an enemy tribe or would come in and, and invade the land and put the people in bondage and the people would go under great suffering. What would they do? They would cry out to God and repent. God would then raise up another prophet who would deliver them and bring reform throughout the land. But once that prophet died, what happened to the people? They would go back into idolatry. So when you read the book of Judges, you can see the cycle would go on and on and on. And this would go on for hundreds of years, even into the reign of the kings. His worst fears were justified. You can see this in 2 Kings 22, 13. He commanded the priest to go and inquire of the Lord concerning this judgment. For the people and for Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord. Have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. So God is saying, judgment is coming. I gave my word and judgment is coming. You know, Moses warned that destruction would come if the Israelites were disobedient to the Lord. Later prophets based their judgment oracles on warnings found in the law of Moses. And you can read this in Jeremiah chapter 6 and also, um, uh, also chapter 2. I'm not sure that that's right. I think I made a mistake there. Josiah may have heard these calamities straight out of the book of Deuteronomy, which you can also read in. So this announcement of coming judgment through calamity echoes earlier announced dynasties of the wicked kings. We had Jeroboam and Ahab. It also paralyzed uh, the indictment in 2 Kings 21 that was delivered by the prophets in the days of Josiah's grandfather, who was Manasseh. Look at verse 17. Because they have forsaken me and have burnt incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath shall be kindled against this place and shall not be quenched. So Judas, having uh, forsaken God for idols, would result in punishment. The prophetess Huldah recognized as forthcoming reality in Judah. Despite Judas having burnt incense to other gods as evidence of their idolatry, which the nations provoked the Lord. Offered to idols were the work of their hands. You know, it says in Isaiah 44, 19, the man never stops to think or figure out why it's just a block of wood. I burnt it for heat and used it to bake my bread and roast my meat. How can the rest of it be a god? Should I fall down before a chunk of wood and worship it? That you will find in Isaiah 44, 19. Uh, God justified greatly since it had been provoked by intentional human rebellion. But the Lord is patient and long-suffering. However, there comes a time where the limits of God's patience were exceeded. Zephaniah indicated that Judah was the 
God's judgment was kindled and it would not be quenched. So this is a very fearful message. Now the prophet Huldah addressed King Josiah specifically and not as the man that you sent. In verse for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord in this manner, you shall speak to him. So Huldah's message of judgment against Judah was she identifies the king specifically as the king of Judah. This description highlighted Josiah's leadership role. The re so here's the rest of 18 and then into 19. Thus says the Lord God of Israel concerning the words which you have heard because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they would become a desolation and a curse. And you tore your clothes and wept before me. I also have heard you, says the Lord. When, when Shaphan spoke of the law to Josiah, the king was shaken to the core. He rent his clothing, which signifies gr grief. So he tore his clothes in response to the words of the scroll that announced Jerusalem would become a desolation and a curse. God heard Josiah, and he had seen his weeping and the state of his heart. It says, which means his heart was humble, and he repented. And God, in hearing Josiah's heart, decided to honor describes such repentance as a prerequisite for the Lord restoring Israel. Judgment, and you can read this in Leviticus 26. Such humble repentance of Ahab's dynasty. You can read that in first one. Judgment. In the days of Isaiah, and to restore his grandfather. The New Testament highlights a centrality of humility and repentance as well. Look at verse 20. Surely, therefore, <clears throat> I will gather you to your fathers and gather to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see all the calamity that I will bring on this place. So they brought back word to the king. So God would honor the king by protecting him from the wrath of God that was coming upon Judah. You know, God gave him a promise. He says, I will gather you to your fathers and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace. Your eyes shall not see the calamity which I will bring upon this nation. You know, hold on to God's promise that he would die at peace with God, that he would be spared the wrath of God. As you know from history, and I've brought this out in many lessons in the past, that the Babylonian Empire would come and conquer Judah. They would come and destroy Jerusalem. They would destroy the temple, and they would take the people of God captive and take them into Babylon, and Jerusalem would lay desolate. God's message through Huldah confirmed anew God's righteousness, faithfulness, and his mercy. You know, God is rich in mercy, and his loving kindness endures forever. God would indeed be faithful to his word. He had uttered centuries before when he warned Israel of the penalties that would result from unfaithfulness to Judah spared while Josiah was alive. But after his death, Judah once again returned to wicked ways. They returned back to worshiping idols, and they experienced the wrath of God, the destruction and of the temple at the hand of of King Nebuchadnezzar, as well as being taken exile into Babylon. 
needs Josiah's, don't we? You know, if there ever was a time America needed Josiah's to rise up and take a stand on God's word, God's truth, and not compromise, it is now. America is headed towards God's judgment, and judgment is coming. We cannot avoid it. Judgment is coming. This nation, in fact, this world and this nation is under God's judgment. But we can turn to God knowing that he is our hope, that he is our salvation. He is sovereign, and he chooses to forestall his judgment if we turn to him with a repentant and a humble heart, just as Josiah did. You know, since 1973, when America legalized this country has murdered over 60 million babies every God is patient and long-suffering, but we have we crossed that threshold just as Judah did during the reign of Manasseh, one of the most wicked kings in Judah. You know, Americans have killed 10 times more human beings than the Nazis did during uh, the Holocaust. How can America think our somehow escape judgment when our sins are 10 times worse the Nazi Germany. The blood of those children cries out of the ground for justice. We had five Supreme Court justices decide that the Bible is wrong and that they know better than God as to what the definition of marriage should be. We have a national debt of $27 trillion. We have a tragic epidemic of murder, rape, violent crime, and out of control. We have thugs and mobs ruling our streets, taking over our cities. We have children being kidnapped and being uh, sold into sex trafficking. trafficking. So my question, is there any hope for America? You know, I believe the judgment is com coming. It is inevitable. But we do have hope. I want to stress that. We do have hope. We have hope in, in a person. And our hope is in Jesus Christ. The lost have hope if they would just turn from their wicked ways if they would just turn to God and grab hold of the lifeline that Jesus Christ has thrown to them. So to the church, if we rise up, we become Josiah's and repent from our wicked ways and cry out to him, he will hear our cry. We all need to be like Josiah sins for the Lord to radically transform us through the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can walk with the Lord no matter what the circumstances are praying the Lord have mercy on this fast track to implosion Josiah in humbling himself repenting for himself and then he repented for the nation, the Lord, to postpone his wrath. God postponed the day of his wrath the nation of Judah for a season. You know, we need to pray for our question. Pray for those leaders who are righteous, who stand on God's word. No, we should pray for the whether they're righteous or to pray even harder and more often for the wicked leaders that God will deal with their hearts and bring conviction upon them. 
to the nation of Israel. If my people, you know, he's not calling the wicked people, the people that don't know him. He's calling to the people that do know him. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal heal their land. 714, which I know that we're all very familiar with. God wants, <coughs> God wants to redeem a nation that is willing to repent. Jeremiah, about all nations, and this includes America. It says in Jeremiah 18, <coughs> 7 and 8, If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation, I warned, repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict it, inflict on it the disaster that I had planned. We need to pray for God to send a great awakening upon this nation. God responds to the prayers of his people. We need pastors and church leaders to consistently call the church to prayer and re God's people who are in, go in government positions, whether those positions are local, state, and with the courage of Josiah to stand upon God's word without compromise. The intimidation tactics of the ungodly. You know, don't be afraid of the ungodly who accuse the righteous of things that they aren't or never will be, accusing us of terrible things. God, you know, stand knowing God is sovereign and God is in control of that situation. God is sovereign and he is in control over this nation. So be not afraid of man. What we do need to fear is have the fear of God. If our godly leaders would do these things, they will lead this country in the right direction. We urgently in America need Josiah to rise up. We, the church of the living God, are called to be such a man in the last days, men and women of God, to rise up and be Josiah's. We're living in dark times in America. Judah also was living in dark times in their Jewish history. Many rose up in Israel warning the people to stay tuned. Many prophets have risen in this country warning America over and over to turn back to God. Some of those prophets have passed away, such as David Wilker, J. Vernon McGee, A. W. Tozer, and many, many others. We have carrying on the mission to preach the gospel without compromise, to call the church to repent. Franklin Graham has continued to work, to, to, has continued the work of his father, Billy Graham. There are many pastors, leaders who are nameless, who are making an impact in their church and in their communities, and they are Josiahs. But sadly, many churches do not. Many churches have taken the word of God and hidden that book somewhere in the back of the church since some where it is no longer read or studied. Absolutely must guard against losing scripture in our churches, our homes, and in our communities and our lives. So let's take our Bibles off the back uh, shelf. Let's blow the dust off our Bibles, open it up, open them up and read them, study, pray, meditate, and act on the word of God. Let's hold God's word high. 
and proclaim his word consistently without compromise wherever we go. Time is short. We are living in the last of the last days. Satan knows that his time is short. This is why he's out there wrecking the havoc that he's doing. We have principalities and powers of darkness that are ruling over um, our country, ruling over Washington, D.C. They're ruling through people that are there that are ungodly. And uh, this is Satan's work. And he knows that his time we desperately need to plead for him <clears throat> to intervene in this country. That God intervene in this country to pray for an awakening that will come across this land. The people will begin to repent and turn their hearts back to the Lord. I hope you found this lesson this evening to be a blessing. I do want to leave you in prayer. <clears throat> I do want to leave and this lesson in prayer. Heavenly Father, <coughs> excuse me. Heavenly Father, we praise you as the God of mercy and grace, whose love for us has been demonstrated in the great mercy that you have shown to Josiah and ultimately through your son, Jesus Christ. We humbly pray and ask for your forgiveness for the times we, we fail to heed your word, for the times that we have we have allowed the cares of this world to take precedence in our lives. We repent and we turn from our wicked ways. We ask for forgiveness for our country, Lord. Pour out your mercy upon our nation and grant us a, a great spiritual awakening that will go from sea to shining sea. Raise up leaders and positions in our government, local, state, and federal. Messiah, who will stand firm for righteousness and not waver to the right or to the left. Send a conviction upon leaders who devise evil plans, who have turned from God and unto their own counsel. Lord, we just pray that mightily with their hearts and bring upon them a conviction. Raise up a president and set a moral example that is based on God's holy word. And concerning the life of the unborn, concerning biblical marriage and raising children, which is according to God's word, calling the nation to honor God, to pray and fast in a crisis. Pour out your mercy upon our towns, our cities, upon our schools and universities, raising up Josiahs who will stand firm on your word, upon our children, turning their hearts back to you in these wicked, dark times. Snatch our children out of the hands of the devil. Bring an awakening to every level of government, every level of our communities, into our schools, colleges, and universities, into our city halls and our courthouses, into our businesses, our factories, and our industries. Convict hearts, O oh Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit. May there be a great awakening in our ministries, in our churches. Call churches who have turned back from God. And, and call them to come back to you, Lord. Raise up Josiahs in lukewarm churches, backslidden churches, apostate churches, who will find the word of God. Boldness, bring the word of God out into the open once again. Send a great awakening to Christ-centered churches who are faithful to God's word, that these churches will be strengthened and empowered even more Empower these churches to keep standing firm in these last days, regardless of the circumstances. That we have your strength to be God-pleasers and not man-pleasers. Bring in a great harvest of souls in these last days. Put a burden for lost souls in our hearts. And bring the mission 
of the Great Commission as a burning desire to fulfill in these last days. Send us to the lost, to the hopeless, to the depressed, to those who are in pain and are without hope. Send us to people who have just given up on life, who, who are in great despair with a message of hope in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we, ask, and we pray this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. I you all back again soon. And I hope and pray that this lesson really blessed your heart. Let me know that if you are with me this evening. Okay.